Uh, Mark Halpern joining us live to discuss this breaking news that's coming in here. Uh, we got this just moments ago. Curtis Ellis joining us as well. We got this just moments ago, this breaking news here, and this has kind of been an on and off again saga here. Uh, how big of a deal is this, uh, Mark, asking you that, and, and what happens next? Well, the judge who, who did take this somewhat unusual action of going to the Court of Appeals and saying, look, I know the defendant and the prosecution want to dismiss the case, but I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. That judge now faces a choice of whether to appeal to the full Court of Appeals, so-called on bank, where you have every judge who's part of that Court of Appeals hear the same case. The decision was a two-to-one decision. Two Republican appointees voted to dismiss the case. One Barack Obama nominee to the uh, District to, uh, Court of Appeals voted not to dismiss it. So it's possible that the judge, who seemed pretty concerned about the, the, the motion to dismiss, it's possible he would appeal to the Court of Appeals. And if he lost there, then there'd be the question of whether we, uh, or if he won there, rather, the question of whether the case would go to the Supreme Court. So while it's clearly a big victory for Michael Flynn, this may not be over yet. It may not be over. He can appeal to the Court of Appeals. Curtis Ellis, weigh in on that for me. Yeah, this is pretty ridiculous. I think Judge Emmett Sullivan should be held in contempt of court. That's what he wanted to charge Michael Sullivan with. The prosecutors want to drop the case. The judge suddenly goes rogue and says, well, I don't care what the prosecutors want. I'm going to take control here. Uh, this is a great victory by the appeals court, a great victory for Michael Flynn. And I would really like to see somebody slap down this uh, Judge Emmett Sullivan. Uh, this is like Les Miserables. This is like the uh, the inspector Javert who will never give up, just, just going to pursue Jean Valjean to the end of time uh, over a loaf of bread. I mean, it it's really shows a, a disrespect for the separation of powers, and the executive branch has the authority, the sole authority to prosecute. If we start entering into a realm where judges can decide who to prosecute, when to prosecute, how long to prosecute. That's not the American system. This judge really has got to, it really has to get a grip, and somebody's got to discipline this guy. Well, uh, Mark, Curtis brings up an excellent point. Just reading some of this, some of the decision came down to, uh, again, paraphrasing, uh, but the harm that could possibly come to the executive branch's prosecutorial power of what this says if the judge is just not going off of what the DOJ's uh, initial order would be, how damaging would that be, uh, Mark? I mean, Chuck, on both sides of this very politically charged case, there are things that are somewhere between unusual and unprecedented that give supporters of each side cause to say, whoa, this is a real problem here. On the, on, on the side of the, the people who think Michael Flynn deserves to be uh, served some time, as the district court judge seems to think, they say, wait a minute, why was this case suddenly dropped? Michael Flynn already pled guilty. He was already fired from his job by the president. That seems unusual and unprecedented. I was just pointed out, on the other side, people say, wait a minute, if the prosecution says we want to drop the case, if the defendant says, yes, let's drop the case, how can the third co-equal branch, the judicial branch, say, no, you must continue to prosecute? That, for people on that side of the aisle, doesn't make any sense. Curtis, let's, just let's looking at... Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, let's try this one on for size. Let's say you had a black defendant in, 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 in the South in the 1950s who they beat a confession out of him. And then the prosecutor decides, well, you know, actually, we, dis we discovered this guy pleaded guilty because he was beaten into confessing. So we're not going to drop the charges because this is an unfair prosecution. But then the judge comes along and says, I don't care what the prosecutor says. I want to hang the guy. How would people feel about that? You'd have an out-of-control judge. It would be pretty cut and dry. And that's, that's really what we have here. We have an out-of-control judge who will not accept no for an answer. And that's what I was going to ask there, Mark. Uh, how, how much of a mockery, if you will, could one say that is being made of the court system right now when you have judges turning into their own prosecution? Yeah, look, I would add to that, that parallel. If, if, what if the, the cops who were involved in the investigation were, were seemingly biased, which is what happened in the case of the lead FBI agent who investigated Michael Flynn and was involved in Mueller's uh, independent counsel investigation? He has shown clear bias against President Trump and the Trump administration in a lot of the private communications of his that have been revealed. So I think that this judge has done something unusual. This is an unusual case. The Court of Appeals has restored something uh, more to the more standard to how these things are supposed to operate. And I believe that, that if the judge does appeal, that while he might win in the Court of Appeals, I don't think he'd win in the Supreme Court.
Uh, Curtis Ellis, what are your thoughts? Uh, do we think Judge Sullivan is done? I mean, he's taken it this far. Why not take it all the way? Well, he's hired his own lawyer. I mean, how out of how how out of the norm is that? I love it. The Democrats talk about President Trump violating the norms. Well, here we have Judge Sullivan violating the norms left and right. He hires his own lawyer to argue against the executive branch. Who's paying this lawyer? And I guess it depends if Judge Sullivan has enough money to pay this lawyer to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Or maybe, you know, this is what they tried to do to Michael Flynn, bankrupt him. Maybe we'll bankrupt Judge Sullivan if he has to pay his own lawyers. I'll leave it right there. Mark Halper and political analyst, thank you for your time, sir. I appreciate it. Curtis Ellis, if you don't mind, stick. We want to bring in our guests for a reaction. We have John LeBoutillier, a former Republican New York congressman and political commentator in our panel of the day with us now, Wendy Patrick, Newsmax columnist, as well as Curtis Ellis, back with us now. John, we'll start with you. Just your top-line thoughts about this case and this decision. Well, it's the end of the case. That's it, finally, no more doubt. Flynn is off the hook, free man on this case. Um, we can argue, and people will, about how it was handled. It was a mess of a case from day one. But it's over, so that for Mike Flynn's point of view, is a good thing. And for President Trump, I think he's going to be happy, he wanted Flynn off. If we remember the February 2017 original conversation when the president cleared the Oval Office and asked Jim Comey, could he see a way to let the Flynn thing go? That was the beginning of all of this stuff. And here we are, it's finally over on you know, June 2020. All right, John, you say it's over, but come on, it's not really over till it's over, right, Wendy? I mean, would you assume that we would hear some pushback from Judge Sullivan? Well, you might, but, you know, one of the things about this case, and Emma, you and I have covered this before, from the very outset, the twists and turns, and just the, so atypical to begin with, that it maybe shouldn't surprise us that it ended as strangely as it began. But you can't try somebody twice for the same thing. Obviously, there hasn't been a jury trial, so it's a little bit different. And it is true that different jurisdictions, federal versus state, can charge different things. But it would almost be um, a surprise if we saw this thing pursued, given what's just transpired. Um, but I don't want to say that that's going to be the final word, Emma, because as you just pointed out, many times along the lines of this Flynn saga, we have been terribly surprised. Um, but it really does seem like it has an air of finality. Let's see if that holds. We will. Uh, President Trump weighing in as well, tweeting this, great. Appeals court upholds Justice Department's request to drop criminal case against General Michael Flynn. Curtis, your response to the president's reaction? Well, the president uh, got what he wanted. Got There's justice being served here. Look, we need to know who is paying Judge Sullivan's lawyer, this other judge, Judge Gleason, because that will tell us if Judge Sullivan wants to pursue this. There have been so many irregularities in this case. We never actually saw the transcript of Michael Flynn's original interview with the FBI agents. But we've learned that it was heavily altered by Lisa Page and Peter Strzok. They, they revised the transcript so they could pursue these charges against him. I mean, that, that's very peculiar. So it seems like Judge Sullivan was, is, is engaged almost in a cover-up here by trying to drag this thing out. So at some point, someone's going to say to him, just drop it. We don't want any more of the irregular irregularities to come to light. So just make it go away, okay? Let's drop it. Or they're going to say, we can't afford to let this thing uh, just, just drop. So we're going to help you defray your legal expenses in pursuing this and appealing it further and further. Because look now at who is on Joe Biden's transition team, someone by the name of Avril Haynes. And she was deputy CIA director. She was involved in all these meetings in the White House with James Brennan and Clapper and Susan Rice at the center of the crossfire hurricane. So there's a there's a, a very deep cabal of uh, involved in this thing. And they're going to be the ones to tell Judge Sullivan, drop it or appeal it.
Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Curtis, you mentioned Brennan, Clapper, Rice, Comey. These are all familiar names for us right now. John, do you expect to see those names being uh, called forth again for further investigation? Uh, well, I think that there is an attempt by William Barr uh, using this Connecticut federal prosecutor. They're going to try this summer to uh, reinvestigate the origins of the so-called Russia investigation. They've been planning this, pushing it. I don't think the public cares anymore. A um, couple things Curtis said that are not correct. There is no transcript of an FBI interview. They take notes. They do not record it. There's no literal transcript. They make notes of it. And General, right. Flynn, General Flynn did lie to the FBI. He admitted to it three times under oath in federal court. And we shouldn't forget that. Curtis, I'll have you uh, respond to that. Yeah, it, it, John is right. There is no transcript. That's very interesting. The FBI has not entered the age of tape recording or digital recording. And uh, that confession that he lied, that was beaten out of him. That was essentially beaten out of him. We will bankrupt you. We will charge your son and drive you both into bankruptcy, if not prison, unless you admit to doing something which you know you didn't do. So we don't like forced confessions in this country, but all of the evidence shows that that's exactly what happened with Michael Flynn. Right. Wait a second, one thing about what he didn't do. He lied about just the conversation. He didn't lie about the contents of it, he lied about having it. And, and you say beaten out of them. Welcome to federal prosecution of how they get people to cooperate. This is mm -hmm. done every day, all the time. And there wouldn't yeah. have been convictions in the Enron case, for instance, the biggest corporate fraud in American history, if they hadn't pushed these people who are inherently dishonest and lie all the time. If you don't push them, they're going to keep lying. Well, it's funny you mentioned Enron because uh, Andrew Weissman was involved in that as well. Uh, he was one. He was Mueller's attack dog, and and Weissman was slapped down for prosecutorial misconduct. So here we have more prosecutorial misconduct. If Michael Flynn was black and they used these same tactics against him, you would see protests in the street about of prosecutorial misconduct law enforcement misbehavior. All right, so. all right, we'll, st we'll stick to this case and, and the facts as it is now. Uh, John Laboulier, thank you for coming on today's program. We really appreciate it. Take care. Wendy, I noticed you were just trying to make a point there. Uh, I'll let you, let you uh, comment. I was just going to say the whole discussion, the excellent debate that I just witnessed, highlights the point that there are so many good people that work in these organizations as well, that we really become overshadowed by ones that are not, by ones that are not on the up and up, that take way, that take measures of gaining convictions, for example. Those are the ones that have been highlighted that we don't agree with. There are so many rank and file that are only there to try to do the right thing and make sure that justice is served. Um, I just want to make sure that we temper that conversation with the other side of things. I understand there are, there are two sides to every story. Yeah, okay. If we can, I uh, want to bring in Brett Tolman. Uh, he should be joining us soon, a former U.S. attorney. Uh, we'll get to him in just a moment. But I do want to have you both react to this breaking news banner that we're receiving right now, that the uh, struck notes actually show that Obama and Biden ordered the Flynn probe here. So perhaps new information in, in this case as to who knew what and when. Curtis, your thoughts? Yeah, this goes all the way to the top. You don't have a counterintelligence uh, investigation without the approval of the president. And now we see that O'Biden, that O'Biden, O'Biden is involved in this up to his eyeballs. This Avril Haynes, Avril Haynes that I mentioned before, she was uh, worked for Joe Biden at the Foreign Relations Committee, and then she was deputy CIA director. She's got deep ties to Biden. And she was involved in all these meetings about Michael Flynn, about Crossfire Hurricane. So uh, the plot thickens. It's going to be a very interesting election season here. Yeah, uh, very much so. Uh, Brett Tolman, I think he's with us now. Uh, Brett, your reaction, of course, to, to learning now that Peter Strzok had uh, had this information that the investigation into Michael Flynn could have potentially been ordered by President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden. 
Well, it certainly does uh, refresh all of our suspicion uh, about this going all the way to the top and that there were individuals in the White House. And now we know that the president, the vice president, certainly were uh, behind pushing the investigation. Uh, the unmasking was part of that effort. Uh, and it's, it's a concern that we all had, but now our fears are, are coming to light. Wendy, your thoughts on potentially, I mean, Obama, Biden, this is an election year and Joe Biden is on that ticket. How could this information potentially impact that? You know, we talked about this coming out a couple of weeks ago. There was already some suspicion and some rumblings that this ex was exactly what happened, that he knew about it, that he was behind it. It didn't seem to gain the kind of traction many people thought that it would back then. It'll be interesting to see if now that he is kind of back on the campaign trail, now that we have actually three big debates coming up, is this going to be sensational enough to have him answer to in one of those debates? The answer to that is probably yes. But will it have an impact on the voters? That's really probably the more important question. Will voters at this point care enough about that to actually make it a campaign issue to where they're not going to cast their vote for Joe? Uh, I, I hate to say it, but if you look at the polls today, you wonder what voters are looking at. I can tell you they're looking at the economy, at jobs, at the kind of kitchen table issues that concern the four of us as well, as well as our viewers. Uh, whether or not Biden and the president and President Obama being behind this is among them will remain to be seen. Curtis, do you think we'll hear from President Trump in regards to any uh, implications for what Barack Obama and Joe Biden might have known and what they might have uh, encouraged to be found out about Michael Flynn? You, you bet we will. We certainly will. Look, Joe Biden has been wrong on every issue, and now he's involved in the greatest scandal in American history. Using the instruments of government, using the instruments of our secret police, our intelligence security operatives, to interfere in political decisions, basically trying to overthrow the will of the people, overthrow an elected president. Uh, and, and, and Joe Biden is now it, it, up to his eyeballs in this. This is not going to go away. And, you know, the Democrats are everybody's concerned about. Uh, police practices and, and unfair prosecutions and, and bad use of uh, the prosecutorial powers of the government. Uh, well, we have another example of it here. It's, it's a little different, but we can't have out of control law enforcement, out of control intelligence agencies. These have to be under strict control and respect the rights of all citizens, including candidates for president and the president himself. Perhaps this is what President Trump was referring to when he met Obamagate. Brett, your final thoughts? <laughs> final thoughts are if you think about what, what we're, we're on the verge of really um, opening up, and that is an understanding that the Obama administration wanted an investigation at the highest level of an incoming president and, and members of his, his um, team, and they use the FISA court, our intelligence powers, in order to orchestrate, not to discover or uncover, but to orchestrate an attack on that incoming administration. It's unprecedented. All right, we'll leave it at that for now. Still a lot more to talk about, though. Brett, Wendy, Curtis, thank you. About 11 years before the Civil War began there, um, and he served in various positions. He was a senator. Uh, he was a vice president. Um, but he also supported slavery, and this is why these calls for him to be brought down as we looked live earlier here. Uh, and again, there are both sides on this one that some want him to come down, some do not, but it's already in the process. Wendy. It is already in the process, and thankfully in some jurisdictions it's in the process peacefully and legally as opposed to vandals tearing down statutes against federal and state law. Uh, but the problem remains the same once we take down these statutes, if in fact we do it the right way. What now? Where do they go? We can't simply say, as we did five years ago, oh, we'll just take them to a museum, because many museums don't want them, can't fit them. These things are enormous or already have enough to, for their historical collections. So many cities are actually looking to private buyers. In fact, there was one in Texas that went for 1.4 million. And then, of course, it's up to the private buyer as to what do you do with it there. You can't just display it on your front lawn, of course, if you live in the same city where it came down. But maybe cities take that money and then reinvest it into the community, jobs, school programs, mental health, the kinds of things that community members need. Maybe that's a solution as to what now.
Yeah, Curtis, back to Wendy's uh, point. This is different. Um, for one, this is a big deal for, for that city. Charleston is such a historic town, so you are changing the image. Uh, that is Charleston, South Carolina. This could be only the beginning of it. But how peaceful it is is something to note. It was done in the proper way that we've been talking about, not like you've seen in other towns and like, uh, states like Virginia. They voted on this. Granted, it was unanimous there for city council in Charleston, South Carolina, but Mayor Tecklenburg came out. He also supported it, and he pushed it through. Um, it, it got voted on. It got approved. Then they hired the company to come and pull it out, and that's what you're seeing now. It's not done by rioters or looters or protesters trying to pull it down themselves. It was done in a peaceful fashion. That's great. That's a triumph of the American system. I love it. Uh, my problem is when you have mob rule, when you have people vandalizing, basically vandalizing these statues. Look, John Calhoun is a controversial figure. He's actually, just for the sake of, uh, for the record, he's one of the founders of the American system. He worked with uh, Senator Clay, uh, uh, Daniel Clay, uh, on, 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 on building America. He supported building America, building roads and canals and, and, and using tariffs and, and building domestic manufacturing. But then he went rogue and he became the vice president of the Confederacy and you know, had some very, very deep problems. But I, I like the fact that the city council voted on this. They decided to take it down. And that's the way it should be done. We can have debates on this. If the Museum of Natural History wants to take down its Teddy Roosevelt statue, that's up to them. Right. And uh, that, that's the way it should be done. We, we can't just have people pulling these things down uh, at, at, at will. You know, that's, right. That's not the way America works. Sure, and this could be uh, displayed as the protocol or the template, if you will, of the country going about to uh, take a look at how Charleston, South Carolina is doing it. Whether you agree or not agree, this is actually how this is done. You can get statues removed if you want to. You push it through your, your city elected leaders, and this is how it's done, and you're seeing that being taken down live there. I want to thank you both. I'm going to get out. Uh, Wendy Patrick, uh, Curtis Ellis, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Conservatives. Panel still here. Wendy Patrick, Curtis Ellis. Um, good to see you, Vince. Thanks so much for coming on the show here. What are your overall thoughts uh, on this one here? The procedural vote in the Senate, it, it, as we know, this one is expected to fail. Well, you know, I'm an advocate of law enforcement, but if policing made everybody safe, Detroit and L.A. and Chicago would be the safest places in the world, and they're not. Uh, but the police are not a security force, and they'll tell you, they're not security guards. They'll tell you that. If these riots did anything else, they proven that uh, every argument against the Second Amendment has been obliterated. Uh, what the thing that keeps people safe is their right to keep and bear arms. The police department is really a um, apprehension and an investigative unit. Ninety-five percent of the crimes are committed by the time they get there. The right for the people to defend themselves is an unalienable right given to them by God. It is irrevocable, non-transferable. It can be violated. It can be infringed upon and abridged. But it cannot be taken away. And many of these liberal mayors have tried to do just that. And because of that, you have all of this violence and all of this chaos. So they bring in the police, and the police are not clairvoyant. Uh, they can't see into the future, and, don't, and they don't know where the crimes are going to be committed. So, of course, violence and, 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 and crimes are taking place in, in, taking place in these areas. And the people uh, don't have the right to defend themselves because these liberal mayors have taken the uh, right away from them, or they've tried to. Well, Vince, you know um, how divisive poli politics can be. We're in an election year. Uh, another divisive statement was made, Nancy Pelosi, saying the Republicans are trying to get away with murder. She says the actual murder of yeah. George Floyd. Your comments on that? Well, George Floyd was a visual... He, it, we originally saw what the Democratic Party has been doing, well, what the liberals have been doing to the black community for the past, oh, God, 200 years. Uh, they've been, con been controlling the black community since uh, the 1800s. They still control it right now. Uh, the Demo uh, the, the, these liberals control every drug den, every housing project, every failed school. So when Nancy Pelosi talks about committing murder to the black community, she should look at Pan Planned Parenthood's something that they control. They should look at these inner cities that can have all the murders. This is something that they control. The Democrat Party controls every aspect of the black community, especially the inner city black community, and these liberals control that. Curtis Ellis, weigh in on that for me. Now, that, those comments by Nancy Pelosi were just 
disgusting. There really is no other word for it. Disgusting to accuse the Republicans of murdering George Floyd. See, this is the type of behavior we don't need in politics. And, and look at this. The Democrats now don't even want to debate the bill. We have a bill that the Republicans have put forward for police reform to incentivize better practices by the police. Rather than debating it and offering amendments, no, they're just blocking it, obstructing it. This is the same old, same old. See, the Democrats have, unfortunately, really dispensed with the American system of governance. They're doing obstruction. And they talk about abolishing police. They talk about uh, mail-in balloting, which will destroy elections, one after another. One in and now Nancy Pelosi accusing the Republicans of murder when her own party will not allow debate in the world's greatest deliberative body. I mean, this is just outrageous. They don't like the Senate Republicans, the Republican senators' bill, because it offers, it does not offer qualified immunity, right? The Democrats want police to, people to be able to sue policemen if they don't like, uh, you know, if they, if they feel they were, they were mis, mishandled by the police. Well, but at the same time, the Democrats don't want us to be able to sue Nancy Pelosi or sue a mayor of a sanctuary city when we get shot by an illegal alien, right? I mean, so qualified immunity for some, but not for others. Yeah. Wendy, I'm going to carry that point over uh, for you from what uh, Curtis was saying there. If, if, if you want changes, make an amendment. Why just block the thing altogether? Yeah, no, that's right. And it's such a productive discussion that we need to have. I mean, when, when, they, when we had this whole defund police movement, what they were really saying is refund police movement, uh, it, police, uh, police agencies. In other words, try to look at the allocation of resources and see if that's the smartest use of the money. Where's the money coming from? Where is it going? How is it being spent? Can we, are we having police officers do the job of mental health professionals, of other kind of professionals? Should they be doing the kinds of things they're doing? So it's one of those things that we can come to a lot of common ground if we actually debated it instead of just debunking it. Uh, and I do note that Nancy Pelosi's comments were unhelpful, to be gracious, but also obstructionist in terms of why don't we talk about some of these things? We may find out that there's more common ground, in fact, when, when it comes to the, you know, the defund, refund, whatever you want to call it, how do we rethink the job of police, given some of what we've seen in the last couple of weeks? That would be productive debate. Vince, last question for you. It, you know, it's been said that folks from the black community cannot be conservatives. This is a taboo topic. Can you respond to that and enlighten us all on that matter, sir? Well, black people are conservative by nature, but what has happened is that the liberals have gotten in and they told them that they cannot trust other conservatives, so they vote liberal. Now, we have to start showing up and start talking to these people again and letting them know how our policies will assist them. Number one. Every American has a right to defend themselves. They talk them into electing officials that are taking their guns and their right to defend themselves away. They say they've been hunted by these people. They say they've been hunted by the police. They say they've been hunted by the gangs. And what are these liberals doing? They're saying, well, give us your guns so that the people that are hunting you can really kill you. Why don't you just be expeditious and blow your own brains out? We have a right to defend ourselves. For years, liberals have decided that whenever a group of black people have come together, that the first thing they must do is disarm them and take away their right to defend themselves. This is why you have the chaos. This is why you have the murder and the crime. People have an unalienable right. It is irrevocable. It is non-transferable. It is unsellable. It is yours to defend yourself, and you should not depend on the police or the government to do it. And when you do depend on them, it does not work. It has never worked. It doesn't work in Detroit. It doesn't work in Chicago. It doesn't work in Memphis. It doesn't work in China. It doesn't work anywhere. It is your right. It is your responsibility. Take it back and tell these liberals that if you're going to take my right to defend myself, you're out. Well said. I'll leave it right there. That is Vince Ellison, live for us from Project 21. Appreciate your time. Uh, Wendy and Curtis, stick around. More to come on that. Uh, Wendy Patrick and uh, Curtis Ellis. Curtis, your thoughts on that? Oh, poor Andrew. He just can't. Uh, he's going through withdrawal. You know, he ended his daily press conferences uh, a couple days ago, and he just can't quit it. He's got to get that got to get that good airtime back. He just can't quit it. You, you tell people in Alabama, you give them another reason not to come to New York. It's going to be like, well, I really didn't want to go there anyway. So 
Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he does these quarantines. Uh, I, I have a feeling it's not going to happen in, in any strict way. Look, at some point, you have to admit that Andrew Cuomo has been wrong on everything. He has been wrong about sending COVID patients into senior living centers, killing senior citizens, when everybody knew those are the most vulnerable. Then he was wrong on ventilators, accusing basically uh, accusing Republicans or President Trump of wanting to kill New Yorkers if they didn't send enough ventilators. Turns out he didn't need them. He, he screamed he needed these hospitals, never used the hospitals that President Trump built in New York. Uh, he's been wrong about everything. He's destroyed the economy of New York. And now he's just driving one more nail into the economy here, telling people, don't come to New York, don't come to New York. I'll tell you, upstate New York is dying. It's dying. The, the tourist season exists for three months. It's over. They're, they're closing the state fairs. They're closing the county fairs. Uh, Andrew Cuomo is not very popular in, in upstate New York. And uh, there's a cult of, of worship in New York City. But he's been wrong about everything. And now he's coming off a bit like the rooster that takes credit for making the sunrise. Yeah. This hospitalizations are down. Deaths are down. He was wrong when he said the rest of the country was going to be where New York was in March. Never happened. Never happened. Yeah, Wendy, Andrew, uh, go me, back. Go me, back into quarantine yourself. Let me bring in Wendy on this and, and, and good points uh, made there. One, you, when, I'm, when I'm hearing this live with you, too, I'm questioning, okay, well, well, how do you enforce something like that? Do you have National Guardsmen at every single entrance or exit on interstates, streets, airports, asking you where you came from? I wonder how much of this is, is, is uh, uh, covering your own butt, if you will, that, that I've inserted uh, this plan asking you to quarantine. If you didn't, that was uh, on you. Uh, the number two, um, you think about how populated these areas are, Wendy. Even if you don't have folks coming in, if you have millions of people already here and the infection's still around, once we get going in the phases, you're still going to see the increases again in cases as we test more. Pay attention to hospitalization rates and death rates. Those are the two you got to watch out for. But this decision is based on uh, cases that have gone up, Wendy. That's right. Those are two great points. And I want to talk about both of them. The first one, uh, you do have to have enforcement or what's the point in having a quarantine rule? Um, let me give you the example of Hawaii that, I, that has that 14 day quarantine rule and enforces it to the point that when people check into hotels and then are seen out and about, they will actually be arrested, arrested, not cited and released, but taken to the police department. So I know that Governor Cuomo has faced some challenges on the enforcement end of some of the rules he's put into place. It'll be interesting to see if this is among them, or if, in fact, he is actually going to enforce this quarantine. Your second point was excellent as well. What about people that live there? They're not coming in from other states, but they're gathering too close together. There again, it goes to the community responsibility to help protect each other. And part of that has to do with staying up to date as to how the virus is transmitted. Do we need to be talking about this three months into it? Yes, because we all know and our viewers know as well, when we go out, we see people not wearing masks, not understanding that masks are designed to protect others from them if they're asymptomatic. Once we can get on the same page in that respect, get up to date with the science, we'll be able to gather in, in uh, crowded areas like in New York City. What a prime example to be discussing that second point. And then perhaps we can continue to make those numbers come down, which, by the way, has bipartisan support, one of the few things we all agree on. Yeah, you know, this thing has already hurt uh, the economy of the entire country so much. And then, of course, the epicenter of it all, New York City, as we know, uh, shuttered this in so many ways. Um, and then, Curtis, back to your point, this basically Basically, it could be read as a banner, don't come to New York, New Jersey, or Connecticut. The real metric is hospitalizations and deaths. Those continue to decline. Now, I, I realize there's a concern about a higher infection rate among younger people who have not been, throughout this entire pandemic, young people have had very mild cases. And, and, and in a way, uh, they're not, that's not the problem. The metrics we have to be looking at are hospitalizations, we wanted to flatten the curve, not to overwhelm the hospital system. We accomplished that. And deaths. Both of those numbers continue to go down nationally. And that's a very good thing.
Yeah, and, and one could one could definitely argue that. Again, that breaking news, a 14-day quarantine issued for those traveling from hard-hit areas uh, in response to coronavirus, hard-hit areas. If you're going to New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, the governors of all three states are asking you to quarantine for 14 days, possibly if, uh, in effect by midnight tonight. We'll keep you posted on that. Uh, Wendy Patrick, Curtis Ellis, thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thank you. Anytime.